is Jamaica Brooks. Rashard is my first cousin. These people that you see behind you are his sisters, his brothers, his nieces, his nephews, his first cousins. Uh, a week and a half ago, me and his older brother were playing chess. And he just popped up. And I said, Cuz, hey, how you doing, man? You, you good? He said, yeah, I came because I, I need to see my wife and my baby, man, my daughter's birthday. I said, you, you staying out of trouble? You all right? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, Cuz. I'm, I'm all right. We shared a few drinks, a few laughs. His big brother gave him a few dollars, and he left. He was always happy. <laughs> he was always smiling. And you'd have to kill him by one of his family members. Because he wasn't that type of dude. So, to you people that are looking around the world and did you have your feelings before it happened to us I could only guess at what you felt but now I understand life shouldn't be this complicated life shouldn't be where we have to feel some type of way if we see a police or somebody of a different color I didn't come down here to talk to the media. I came to love on my people. If you ask how old this young black man was, look at your children when you see them laugh. That innocence, that joy, that pureness of soul. And you had a glimpse of what we lost. You have a glimpse of of what it feels like because tomorrow we're going to have to deal with it again in value of life where that a man that was running away doesn't get shot twice in the back and now there's a question of was it reckless or um, should he have uh, used that force let me tell you and show you why shoot him in a crowded parking lot is so reckless and so unnecessary of what he did. A witness today sent us his vehicle, which was hit by one of Officer Rose's bullets while he and his kids were in the car. A couple feet up and we would have had another loss of life. So, Trying to justify the actions of shooting at uh, Mr. Brooks as he's running away in a crowded Wendy's parking lot uh, when you can easily catch him later for uh, what started off as a very non-confrontational situation. Um, it can be justified. It cannot be justified. Otherwise, we're going to continue to lose lives from stray bullets shooting at someone that should have never been shot at. And people ask, how could this have ended? Why didn't, why did he resist? Why it could have ended there? Well, it also could have ended here. I can walk. My sister's house is right here. That's how this could have ended. It didn't have to go to that level. And that's what we're saying in America with policing is this type of empathy is gone. The courtesy of an officer, it wasn't like he was called there because Mr. Brooks had been swerving and was a danger to society. The first call was because a man was asleep. Where is the empathy in just letting him walk home? That's what policing is supposed to be, no matter what color you are. But as they said, that's broken, that's gone. We don't see that often, and we definitely don't see it in the African American community. So just like the protests before, that's what we're demanding. It's not just laws and policy changes, but a mental change in policing. That was the first cousin of Rayshard Brooks. Followed by Chris Stewart, the attorney for the family of Rayshard Brooks.
Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Monday, June the 15th, 2020. On this episode of The Politocrat Podcast, a completely different approach. I have questions, and I suspect that you do as well. I think we all have questions. Questions about a lot of things. But on this episode, the questions are going to be around Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and Rashad Brooks. I'm going to be asking some questions. Some of those questions you probably have the answers to or know what the answers are in your own mind. These questions are meant to be thought about and they certainly are meant to be answered. Certainly by those in power. I will be asking Many questions. Next. Welcome back. Why did it take nearly three months to arrest the murderers? of Ahmaud Arbery. Why was one of those murderers allowed to be free and appear on CNN's Cuomo primetime? When it was so clear that he was the person who videotaped the lynching, who recorded this lynching on his own cell phone and used his own truck. Why was he allowed to go on talk shows on television before finally being arrested a week or two later? Why have the killers of Breonna Taylor not yet been fired and arrested. It has been three months, more than three months, since those three cops busted into her home in the middle of the night and shot her eight times as she slept. Why haven't these three cops in Louisville, Kentucky, who murdered her, been arrested? Why haven't they been fired? Why haven't all four of the cops who killed George Floyd been charged with second degree murder. There is video of bystanders pleading with one of the cops who just stood there and did nothing. while George Floyd was calling for his mother, who had already passed away at least two or three years ago. Bystanders shouting at the cop that was just standing there. Telling that cop that his partner was killing George Floyd.
two other officers had their knees in the back of George Floyd, who was already handcuffed on the ground. And Derek Chauvin had his knee on the neck of George Floyd for nearly nine minutes. Why haven't each and every one of those cops been charged with murder? Derek Chauvin was charged with second degree murder. Why wasn't he charged with first degree murder? Derek Chauvin and George Floyd knew each other from working at a nightclub as security at that nightclub in Minneapolis. It appears to be well established that Derek Chauvin was a racist. It appeared to be, appeared to be well established that Derek Chauvin did not like George Floyd. And obviously, we can see on that video that Derek Chauvin wanted to end the life of George Floyd. The mere fact that he sat on his neck for nine minutes would make that abundantly clear. He intended to kill George Floyd. Why wasn't he charged with first degree murder? Why was he initially charged with third degree murder? Why did it take almost a week to arrest him? Given what we'd seen on that video. Why did it take nearly two weeks to arrest the other three cops who were involved in his death, the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd? Why wasn't this case immediately given to a special prosecutor? In this case, the Attorney General of the State of Minnesota, Keith Ellison. Why did police in Atlanta confront Rayshard Brooks in fact I'm going to rewind why did someone at Wendy's see fit to call the police on Rayshard Brooks who was sleeping in a car in his car Why did someone at Wendy's feel it necessary to call the police on a man, a black man, sleeping in his own vehicle in the middle of a line of cars? Why was that necessary? Why couldn't somebody tap on his window? Why couldn't somebody honk their horn to wake Rashad Brooks up? Why did someone feel that that was the idea to call the cops was the first thing on their mind? Why was there not an attempt made that we know of to wake up Mr. Brooks? by honking their horns. 
Did anybody honk their horns? Did anybody drive around his car in that Wendy's drive through last Friday in Atlanta? Why did that person at Wendy's, whomever it was, feel the need to call the cops on somebody who was sleeping in his car? Why? Why did the officer who is now on desk duty feel the need to ask Rayshard Brooks if he had weapons on him? Why would that be a question that you would ask him? Would you ask that question of a white driver? Did the police who received the phone call, namely yourself, from the dispatcher, was there anything in the dispatcher's dispatch to you, to this cop, that said that this guy had weapons? This guy meaning Rayshard Brooks. There was no probable cause to even suspect that he had a weapon. So why would you ask him if he had weapons? Are you imputing criminality to a black person? The young man was sleeping in his car. Why did you have to ask him if he had weapons? Why? Again, would you have asked that of a white person who was sleeping? Were you more interested in killing someone that you were afraid of and that your racist fears and the racism of this system had indelibly burnished into you and your own personal racist fears? Is that what you were acting on? Or were you handed some kind of probable cause to even ask a question like that of a man who was sleeping in his car. The person who called Wendy's, what was their phone call? What did they say in that phone call to the police? The officer, the cop who is now on desk duty, who asked to pat down Mr. Brooks, who, by the way, consented to the pat down, found no weapons on him. He had no weapons on him, no guns, nothing. Why didn't this officer offer Mr. Brooks, a ride home. Why did this officer choose instead to make a phone call to another officer to give him a breathalyzer test? Why? There was only one officer on scene on Friday night in Atlanta in that Wendy's and that was the officer who had asked if there were any weapons on Mr. Brooks. These two officers were not patrolling together. Why? Having realized there were no weapons, why did you decide to call in to another officer 
to administer a breathalyzer test. Why did you have to call another officer to do that? Why did you, instead of escalate, Why didn't you decide to de-escalate? Why didn't you just offer Rayshard Brooks a ride home? In conversations on video that we are seeing, cordial conversations, Mr. Brooks had been telling these two officers that he lives, or at least he has, a relative's house down the street from where they were in the Wendy's parking lot in the drive through and that he could just walk to that location. The officers said no. The officer that murdered him, that would end up murdering him, said no. I'm going to give you this breathalyzer test. Why was he so hell-bent on getting his arrest, his collar, his quota of arrests? Why did Garrett Rolfe push that issue, push and push? I'm going to give you a breathalyzer test. Now, never mind the fact that Ray Shard Brooks consented to the test. Why couldn't you be more interested in the well-being and safety of Rayshard Brooks? Why weren't you more interested in just offering him a ride home or calling him a taxi? He could have ample opportunity to pick his car up later, the next morning, presumably when he was more sober if indeed he was inebriated to begin with. How does an inebriated man manage to tackle two police officers, punch one of them, take the taser of the other and run away? That's a mighty fine feat for someone who's drunk. Unless he really isn't drunk at all, or maybe he's only had one drink, which is what he said on the video, maybe one and a half drinks. He said. Why did the officer have to give him the breathalyzer when all he had to do was simply say, Sir, would you like a ride home? Since the original officer had obviously seen that Mr. Brooks was not an issue in terms of any kind of problem, he was cordial, he was compliant. In fact, he was ingratiating, if anything. And he was extremely polite. He was deferential and respectful. And since the first officer saw and knew that, and we saw and knew it, why did he have to call the second officer in? It's at that point that the problem really begins. In fact, it began even before this officer. As I said earlier, why on earth were the police called to begin with? Rayshard Brooks was not a threat to anybody. So since he would not be a threat to anyone, sleeping in his vehicle. Why on earth did some bright spark at Wendy's call the police to begin with? Why is that necessary? Why was it necessary for that breathalyzer test to be administered? And if you knew that A, Mr. Brooks had no weapons and B, that he was cooperating with you at every level and was being very polite to you and cordial and nice to you and respectful of you. Why didn't you just let him go on his way? You wouldn't have done this with a white person 
who was being cordial and respectful. Heck, you wouldn't have done it with a white person who had been nasty to you. You would have told them to go on home. You would have offered them a ride in your vehicle or you would have called them a taxi. So why was it that you chose not to do these things for Mr. Rayshard Brooks? Why was the dash cam video in one of those videos on the ground? Did the original officer whose dash cam or I should say body cam video it belonged to place it on the ground? Why weren't we able to see the other dashboard or the body cam of the actual cop, Garrett Rolfe, who murdered Mr. Rayshard Brooks? Why didn't we see his body cam? Why didn't we see video of what happened after Garrett Rolf murdered Rayshard Brooks. Why has that not been shown on the news media, cable, television news? If that video is publicly available, where is it? Has it only been released to the media? Or is it publicly available? Has the Georgia Bureau of Investigations released this publicly beyond the media? Why did Garrett Rolfe, after killing Rayshard Brooks, say that, quote, I got him, end quote. Why did he have to say that? Why did he say that? After you've killed this young brother, why did you, Garrett Rolfe, see fit to say to your partner, I got him. You were not in fear of your life, were you? People who are in fear of their lives do not say things like, I got him, after they have shot someone running away from them, shot them in the back twice, How could this be anything but murder? It cannot be anything but murder. Why did Garrett Rolfe, running after Rayshard Brooks, run into a red parked car, drop his taser. And then even before Mr. Brooks would turn around, why was Garrett Rolf already reaching for his gun? Why was he doing that? Doesn't that form intent? And on top of that, Rayshard Brooks had a weapon that was not a deadly weapon. Garrett Rolfe knew that. Why would a cop chasing after someone start to reach for his weapon? Why would he be reaching for his gun when someone is running away from him and not towards him? It seems to me that that is the question that you ask. Did Garrett Rolfe had murder on his mind? 
Did Garrett Rolf have murder on his mind? Is it indeed true that Atlanta police were picking up casings from the bullets that were fired by now ex-cop Garrett Rolf? Is it true that the police on scene did not check his pulse? That is, did not check Rayshard Brooks's pulse for two minutes and 16 seconds? Is it true that they literally did that? Why would they do that? Why would they be more interested in clearing a crime scene of evidence, compromising a crime scene, before checking on the pulse and the life of a human being that they had just shot at three times, hitting him twice in his back? Where are the full videos of what happened? Was the video edited? Were any of these videos edited? Obviously, they were edited for the sake of the news media showing them on the air. But were these videos edited by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation prior to release? And as for the Wendy's surveillance camera, which caught the shooting in widescreen view, if you will. Where is the remainder of the footage after the shooting? Where is that footage? Has any of this footage been deleted? And if so, who deleted it? If the footage has not been deleted, where is it? There were witnesses with cell phone video who surely took video of the scene. Why does one of the videos taken by someone who's put their video on Facebook, at least as it's been shown in the media, and I haven't seen the full video on their Facebook page, but why does that video miss out something? Why do we get this close up and then all of a sudden we don't get anything more? We get the close up and then we see people running and then... Right down the other end, we see someone falling down or they've just fallen down. Has something been edited out of that video? Why do you think Rayshard Brooks would run from the police? Do you not think that black people have good reason to run from the police? Especially considering the fact that the conversation was cordial. In fact, the conversation was cordial with the first officer. It was the second officer, Garrett Rolf, who was less cordial, was jumping to conclusions, was arrest oriented, could have easily said, Sir, we're going to drive you home. Sir, we're going to call you a car, a cab. Rashad Brooks, Rashad Brooks offered, said that he could just walk home. They had his license plate. They had his driver's license. So why didn't they just let him go? Why didn't they give him a desk appearance ticket or some kind of summons? If they wanted to get some kind of further interaction with him, 
with him, him being Rayshard Brooks, why didn't they just say, Mr. Brooks, we summon you to appear before a magistrate or before a court somewhere or return to the precinct, whatever it might have been. And when you were pursuing Rayshard Brooks, why didn't you just let him go? Let him run. You can always find him. Why couldn't you let Rayshard Brooks go? You had his driver's license. You had that information. You had his license plate. You had that information. Why couldn't you let the young man go? If a young man or an old man or a young woman or an older woman is running away from you, you do not shoot them. That is murder. Why did Garrett Rolfe have to murder Rayshard Brooks? Why did Garrett Rolfe have to fire that weapon at all? Why did he even have to fire it at all? Rayshard Brooks had been searched. No weapons were on him. No weapons were on his person or anywhere. There would have been no need to put your hand on your weapon in the first place and even fire it once. There hadn't had to be any need to shoot to wound him. There hadn't had to be any need to shoot to maim him. This is not even about shooting to disable or disarm somebody. The young man is running away. Not running toward you, running away from you. There is no need to shoot him at all anywhere. Why was he shot to begin with? Given everything you knew, you had his license plate, you had his driver's license, you searched him for weapons. He had none. He was cordial and respectful toward you. He offered solutions. I'll walk this way. The house is just down here. Why did you disregard all of that? Why didn't you instead offer him a ride home? Why didn't you call a cab for him? He can always get his car the next morning. There are white people who are very hostile to law enforcement. Some of those individuals are very hostile to to law enforcement. They are not respectful at all. If you do not believe me, you can go to YouTube and watch. And they don't get killed. And I'm not advocating for it. I'm not advocating it for anyone. Why is it that the police don't ever, in the vast, vast majority of cases, if ever, kill someone who is white, who is arguing with the police, who comes at the police with swords, knives, cars. Somehow they are not ever killed. But a black person who is sleeping has the cops called on him. There are so many more questions to be asked in all of these cases. 
Breonna Taylor's, Ahmaud Arbery's, George Floyd's, Rayshard Brooks, and so many others. There are always more questions. Another question. When will we get answers? I'll leave you now with the words of Tomika Miller. She is the widow of Rayshard Brooks. I just want to thank everybody for all the protests and love and support that you guys have done. Um, I, I can't, words can't explain how thankful I am for everything. Even though I can't bring my husband back, I know he's down smiling because his name will forever be remembered. And, um, no, there's no justice that can ever make me feel happy about what's been done. I can never get my husband back. I can never get my best friend. I can never tell my daughter, oh, he's coming to take you skating or swimming lessons. So, it's just going to be a, a long time before I heal. It's going to be a long time before this family heal. That's, like I said, I'm just thankful for everything that everyone is out there doing and I just ask that if you could just keep it as a peaceful protest that would that would be wonderful because we want to keep his name positive and great